Hello, everybody, and welcome to Project HR, a podcast dedicated to building better workplaces. Project HR is brought to you by Projections, an IRI company. IRI helps organizations navigate workplace challenges, improve employee engagement and productivity, manage labor relations, and implement effective communication strategies to achieve their goals. For more information, you can visit Projections online at projectionsinc.com and IRI at iriconsultants.com. I am Jennifer Oroqua, Director of Business Development for IRI and your host for today's episode of Project HR. The retail industry has faced many challenges in recent years. The continuing shift to online shopping, chronic supply chain issues, staff shortages, all of which has emboldened labor unions, who filed 77% more retail industry representation petitions in 2021 than they did in 2020. Where that number will go in 2022 is an educated guess, and even if you're not in retail, there are always lessons we can learn outside of our core industries. So joining me today is Evan Armstrong, Vice President of Government Affairs at RELA, the Retail Industry Leaders Association. Evan is here to talk about the state of things in retail, what his association does, and the events that RELA offers, as well as the recently published Labor Activity and Retail Report produced by IRI Consultants and sponsored by RELA. Evan, thanks so much for joining me here today on Project HR. Of course, Jennifer. Thank you for having me. So I want to start off by talking about RELA, the Association for Retail Leaders. What is your mission? What role do you play in advancing the industry? Sure. Um, well, um, you know, the Retail Industry Leaders Association is what its it name suggests. Uh, we're a trade association that represents the leading, most innovative retailers in the United States. We're based in D.C., so much of our work is on the public policy and advocacy side of things. And we represent our members uh, on a range of issues from tax trade uh, to, of course, workforce policy. And of course, RELA hosts a number of regular events. Have you seen increased interest in events given the current climate in retail? Absolutely. I mean, really, uh, we've always had strong participation from our executive communities across issue areas from workforce to tax uh, and everything in between. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the pandemic really uh, accelerated and generated a lot of interest uh, because we were all dealing with a very novel situation in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think RELA served a vital role bringing together executives in the retail industry to figure out how do we get through this? Uh, How do we serve our customers uh, in a safe way? How do we serve our workers, our employees in a safe way? And, you know, I think that generated a lot of interest. And I think, uh, you know, RELA acquitted itself well over the last two years, you know, turning to this year and really starting last year, there has been greater interest in um, labor organizing in in the sector. Uh, And I think Mm -hmm. part of that um, interest is because the pandemic created new dynamics. I think, Social media and younger generations of workers uh, are a brand new, uh, you know, factor here uh, Mm -hmm. when it comes to labor organizing. And so, you know, our groups uh, that I oversee who, uh, you know, head up labor relations at our member companies are are very interested to figure out what's happening in the industry and and what uh, potential strategies need to evolve uh, to continue, uh, you know, operations uh, as we have and will want to continue. And I'm sure those events, you know, creating that that sense of community and being able to bounce ideas off of one another in in really an unprecedented situation um, was was incredibly valuable to your members. So what concerns are you hearing now from RELA members? Has their focus shifted post-pandemic? I mean, we're still dealing with the the tail of the pandemic. Um, So those uh, concerns are still there and there's still policy implications, uh, you know, especially related to OSHA and health and safety uh, regulations. But I think the you know, really the central concerns from my groups, you know, in the HR and in the labor relations space are um, the the competition for talent, the need mm. for more people, the lack of, uh, you know, the, the amount of openings uh, in retail is just uh, is huge. Mm-hmm. And I think we're not alone. Uh, I think every industry is dealing with talent shortages for any number of reasons. Uh, but I think that specific factor has empowered, um, you know, labor uh, and employees uh, to flex uh, their muscle, their influence um, a bit more. Uh, And I think we're seeing that play out in real time. Mm -hmm. And employers uh, are going to have to think strategically about how do we maintain the labor relations policies that we want while continuing to serve and meet demands of the current workers and uh, potential workers we're trying to recruit. So I think it's going to be a continued balance. Um, and I think that's why, you know, we've been working with, uh, you know, our partners like IRI to figure these things out mm-hmm. and hopefully develop, you know, good strategies for the industry. 
Yeah, for sure. And and with all that buzz and, and turnover and new employees, you know, it makes sense that we would work together um, on this labor activity and retail report. So what do you see as some of the biggest takeaways here? You know, I, I was very interested. I was I was looking through the report last night and, you know, comparing it to last year. And there was certainly there's just we, it's clear there's more activity across the economy in labor organizing. And there's specifically more activity in retail. Um, I think the success rate of the organizing petitions in retail has really spiked up. Um, and I think we're starting, we're seeing that throughout the news. You know, there's a, there's a Starbucks uh, union created, it's seemingly every other day. Mm -hmm, uh, sure. So there, there's a lot of winning happening on the labor organizing side. Um, and so I think it is raising alarms uh, for the broader retail community uh, because uh, I suspect there will be efforts at other retailers. It won't be contained to the Starbucks uh, and Amazons. Yeah, for sure. So were there any big surprises in the report, in your opinion? There weren't any big surprises to me, but I, I recall being uh, struck by the density of organizing in just a handful of states. Mm -hmm. So was, uh, I believe California, Illinois, and, and one other uh, you know, pretty blue state uh, mm -hmm. that were really driving the total trend. Uh, but you were seeing organizing across all the states. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I was struck by uh, those three states really driving the momentum, it seems. Yeah, I agree. I found that interesting as well. All right, Evan, I'm going to take a quick sponsorship break right now. But when we return, I want to get into more details of the report. Stay with us. Are you confident that your supervisors know how to support your company's direct connection with employees, even when you have the best intentions? And especially if your company is successful, unions may target your employees. How can you make sure that your managers and supervisors know how to support your union-free operating philosophy in a positive way? LaborWise Leadership eLearning will give your frontline leaders the training they need anywhere anytime on any device. With interactive elements including videos, quizzes, and downloadable transcripts, LaborWise Leadership's curriculum covers all aspects of meeting employee needs while remaining union-free. Better still, you'll have the peace of mind that comes from knowing your leaders are well-trained and would never violate employee rights. Learn more and get a free demo or trial of LaborWise Leadership e-learning today at laborwiseleadership.com. I'm back now with Evan Armstrong, Vice President of Government Affairs at RELA, the Retail Industry Leaders Association. Evan, we're talking about the Labor Activity Report, and it breaks down retail labor stats on a national and a state level. It even details retail strikes. How do you hope that retailers will use this information? Yes, I, I think, you know, all information is good and good information is even better. I think the report is really good information uh, that the executives that I interact with that are companies who head up labor relations strategies uh, really will use this to make sure that it matches their own internal reporting, their own internal heat maps uh, that many of them analyze to understand where there's some risk points. And I think the density in those three states that we mentioned, I think is going to be interesting to, to a lot of folks. And I think, you know, just... I think the data ultimately will allow these folks to go internally with their reports that go up to the C-suite and say, look, there's an issue here. And if you didn't know it already, uh, or you haven't talked to Howard Schultz already, uh, <laughs> you know, we need to be more prepared. And this is what we need to do organizationally to head off things. And I think that's where the strategies that are developed in this report are going to be very key. Mm -hmm. So another big part of the report focuses on changes in labor law. Can you talk about the kinds of changes we're seeing now? Oh boy, um, <laughs> it's uh, it is uh, you know to to borrow from a, a famous movie, a target rich environment uh, at the moment. Mm -hmm. If you are uh, head of workforce policy here in D.C. for an association, it is a busy time. Um, so you know when you have an administration change, there's always uh, new dynamics at play, but. You know, when there's a Democratic administration, you're just going to have a heavier dose of activity on the labor front. So we have a National Labor Relations Board with the Democratic majority and a very aggressive GC, Jennifer Abruzzo, mm -hmm. uh, opening up new briefs to change precedents. Uh, Jennifer Abruzzo has uh, issued several memorandum outlining very uh, large changes to settled law, ranging from 
uh, card check to captive audience meetings. Mm -hmm. And it is really uh, an aggressive strategy that the NLRB and the GC is, has been pursuing. Uh, and so we're completely engaged uh, there, uh, not only from a brief writing process, but an education and PR standpoint about what the board is doing and its impact, not just on retail, but on the American economy. Mm -hmm. Um, because policymakers, you know, you think they know everything, but um, a lot of them don't focus on the NLRB. Uh, so there's a lot of education that we have to do about the impacts of these changes that are happening and will continue to happen. And uh, again, it's a, it's a very busy time. Um, this is all rooted in, you know, President Biden coming in and saying he was going to be the most friendly president mm -hmm. to organized labor since uh, FDR. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think he's holding true to his word. Uh, I think, you know, from firing uh, Peter Robb, the Republican general counsel on the board, you know, a few minutes after the inauguration speech to the current policies they're pursuing now uh, really showcase uh, their desire and intent to uh, move the needle in favor of labor organizing, even at the expense of good governance or the expense of actually what workers need and want. So I want to dig in a little bit into Abruzzo's memo on employee meetings. I think it was particularly interesting for companies in retail and, and manufacturing that re rely heavily on being able to meet with employees. And of course, coming uh, in the wake of the White House task force recommendations, really, what should retailers be paying attention to right now? You know, I, the captive audience meeting memo is has really massive ramifications. It's written broadly. Uh, but taken with the actions and the tone of the board and the GC, it has a chilling effect on employers, right? You know, not knowing where the line is uh, about how and when and where I can communicate with employees uh, about labor organizing it is a very substantial change to the law. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there are uh, ramifications we won't see because I think employers will maybe not do things that they would have done. And I do think that was the intent of the memo. Mm -hmm. um, and generally speaking, every move by the administration, by the board, by the Department of Labor, um, you know, across the board has been to make it easier for labor organizers to win organizing fights. Mm -hmm. And so you see, you know, coming out of the gate, and pushing for the PRO Act to be passed in Congress. You know, you're, you're seeing a lot of these PRO Act policies, like a ban on captive audience meetings, now moving through the board. Mm -hmm. um, so all these changes are to tie the hands of employers and to give more tools and ability for labor organizers to win elections, even if, again, ultimately these policy changes uh, could harm employees who may want a secret ballot election because they fear intimidation mm -hmm. in the workplace. They really do want information from their employer about a very significant life decision about, do I want to join a union, right? Mm -hmm. It's a big decision and a costly one potentially. And so these guardrails are being taken away uh, from policymakers by the administration and the board um, and I think ultimately they're they're going to damage the ability for for individual workers to make sound, fair, balanced decisions about what they want to do in their in their careers. So, Evan, I want to shift our focus a little bit and talk about the challenge of worker activists today. In your view, is it possible for retailers to work with these employees to channel their passion and perhaps transform those activists into employee advocates? Yes, I, I think there there's a chance to do that, but I think employers, our members, are going to have to rethink. Um, some of their strategies for employee engagement, because really the playing field has shifted in terms of the demands and desires of workers and really the younger Gen Z uh, workforce that desires and really demands and expects uh, to be part of the table in terms of the organizational's core missions, goals, and decision making. And that's a big shift, right? It's not a labor organizing campaign about your know, hourly wage or benefits. Starbucks broadly was very good on those issues already, right? Mm -hmm. and the, the, the Starbucks uh, thing is, is much different uh, than a traditional labor organizing fight. And I think corporate leaders are going to have to you know, deal with this new dynamic, this, this new expectation from younger workers. Um, and I think we've seen the breadcrumbs of this over the last few years with the rise of social activism, but really corporate social activism and, you know, taking positions on, you know, political issues, taking issues on social issues. 
And I think now there's an expectation that if you don't do that, your employees may force action. Mm -hmm. I think this is just another extension of, you know, a trend we were already seeing. And uh, I suspect that, uh, again, you know, uh, retail leaders and uh, broadly corporate leaders are are trying to grapple and, and rethink potentially all their strategies around employee engagement, because ultimately, you know, a lot of big brands, certainly uh, many of the retail brands we represent have really great purpose brand identities, and they want their employees to buy into that. But if there's a disconnect between what the employees desire and what they think you're representing, then I think you're going to see some uh, division and, you know, some of the the things that we're seeing in the labor organizing space. And, you know, I think smartly, uh, you know, labor labor organizations, AFL, SEIU, UFCW, are, have been positioning themselves on the side of social justice issues, and they're kind of riding that wave uh, to generate more activity. So uh, mm-hmm. certainly a challenge, but I think as long as, you know, uh, executives and leaders, our managers are, are thinking uh, proactively about these challenges, I think there's an opportunity to uh, to win out and, 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 and continue the operations that uh, they want. So I think what we're all seeing is that intersection of community and authenticity is what employees are looking for these days. But what can retailers do now to prepare for anticipated increases in labor activity? Yeah, I think they need to be very on the ball uh, with their employee engagement surveys. And I think they need to understand the pulse, uh, the attitudes of their frontliners, uh, what the expectations are. And I think they have to mine that information. I think management trainings uh, are going to have to be rethought. Um, You know, it's, again, not the simple, clear issues of labor organizing that we've seen before. They're much newer, more dynamic, uh, a little bit more intangible. And I think that managers are going to have to be retrained on how to how to identify these issues. And so, um, you know, I think every corporation should should think through where they want to be and is their workforce aligned with the organization's goals? And if they're not, uh, you know, how do they bridge that gap? All right, Evan, it's time for us to take another quick break. We'll be right back after this. You're listening to the Project HR Podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Oroqua, and my guest today is Evan Armstrong, Vice President of Government Affairs at RELA, the Retail Industry Leaders Association. And we are back. Now, Evan, as you mentioned in our last segment, there is, of course, strength in numbers. So one great move is membership in industry associations. For retailers, what's involved in becoming a RELA member? So to become a RELA member, there are some requirements. You know, our, our name is the Retail Industry Leaders Association. So our membership is only the largest retailers in the country, typically over a billion dollars in annual sales, um, operating pretty much across every state uh, in the United States. And, and the reason for that is, you know, RELA was created to be a very clear community of peers. Uh, so when the CEOs get together, there really is that, oh, you're on my level type of pers- uh, perspective of the world. Um, so, you know, if there are folks listening in who uh, work for organizations, uh, retailers who fit the bill and aren't members already, um, you know, always love to, to hear from you and figure out if, if RELA can be uh, a value. Yeah, for sure. So what are the benefits of being a member? So I I think the benefits were really accentuated throughout the pandemic, Um, you know, ranging from weekly calls, uh, biweekly calls with uh, high level executive communities throughout 2020 and really going most of last year, uh, being able to benchmark and create wholesale new policies around safe safety and wellness. You know, we had the heads of store operations and CEOs talking about how they were reconfiguring their stores, reconfiguring their headquarters. And that was vital information uh, for folks to be able to share so they could operate in the in the best way possible in a very chaotic uh, environment, right, during mm-hmm. the pandemic. So I think that is a crucial element of the real value of just bringing that peer-to-peer network together to understand the challenges of the day uh, and really share best practices, not only for individual businesses, but for the industry as a whole. Because ultimately, we work for the industry. We want a strong retail industry, and that's what our members want. And I think if they can collaborate on good policies that you know, move the industry forward in a positive way, um, you know, then it benefits, you know, the, the rising tide lifts all ships. So that's really what we try to do is, is listen to our executive communities, listen to our member companies, uh, hearing what their challenges are, 
and figuring out what those policies we can advocate for that move the industry forward uh, in a positive way. Perfect. And I know we touched on events earlier, and I know RELA has a full roster of events, meetings, roundtables, conferences, um, summits scheduled throughout the year. Why are these events so critical to your mission and to your members? Right. I mean, throughout the pandemic, you know, we did, you know, all, all virtual, uh, as many people did, and we got real used to and tired of Zoom uh, <laughs> or whatever uh, virtual, uh, you know, uh, tool you used. Uh, but I think the in-person meetings, which we have started to get back this year, uh, you know, with our supply chain conference in February, we just wrapped our asset protection conference in Orlando to a great success. Uh, and we are going to have our in-person Labor and Employment Committee meeting next month, uh, as you know, and I think people just want to be in person, you know, see their colleagues, get to shake hands, get to really talk about kind of in the weeds things that you may not want to discuss on a Zoom call. Mm -hmm. And I think there's so much value in the face to face and there's probably a yearning for it, uh, you know, among all working Americans to make sure that they can see their peers and colleagues and uh, clink glasses and sit next to you in a meeting and, and, and chat about the issues of the day. So um, I think the value is just being able to, to be with your, your industry uh, counterparts and learning from them and sharing best practices. And I think that's why uh, people value RELA. And I think that's why we'll have a, a great meeting next month. Yeah, perfect. So where can we go to find out more about you, about RELA, about the labor activity and retail report? Sure. You know, it's www.rela.org. You know, our uh, website uh, digital team uh, works extremely hard to update it with great content and information. So if you know nothing about RELA, go to the site. You can check it out. If you want to dive into an issue area like workforce, very easy to get to the workforce page where you can cover, you know, anything ranging from the board NLRB to the PRO Act to uh, the IRI uh, RELA labor report. We have the uh, uh, report from last year on a live link there. We will get a new link to the new report uh, here in the next couple of weeks, which we're very excited about. So again, uh, www.rela.org or uh, feel free to, to reach out to me directly at evan.armstrong at rela.org. Always happy to chat. Perfect. And I want to let, be sure to let everybody know that we have done all the hard work for you. We have listened back to this episode and taken fantastic notes. And those notes and links will all be included in this episode's companion guide, including a link to the labor activity in retail report. So be sure to unlock that today at projectionsinc.com slash podcast. Right now, though, Evan, it is time for our lightning round questions. And these are questions I ask of every guest of the podcast. Are you ready? Okay. All right. So our first question is always a topic showdown. In this episode, we've been talking about the challenges facing the retail industry. In your opinion, which of these quotes from successful retailers speaks the loudest? The biggest sources of opportunity are collaboration and partnership. And that's from Mark Parker, who's the CEO of Nike. Or you can't deliver good service from unhappy customers, which is from Tony Shea, the former CEO of Zappos. So, you know, I was reading, I read through those quotes and I'm going to throw a third option at you because I think it really speaks to a lot of what we discussed today. And this is actually from Howard Schultz. And it said, the challenge of the retail business is the human condition, which I think is great because the human condition is always evolving, changing, and it's fickle. And I think that's the dynamic we're in right now in that the consumer is changing their behavior and retailers are responding. And I think the retail workforce is is changing their behavior as well. And and we have to meet the challenges of the day and I'm sure our members will. But um, I thought I had known that quote and I I thought it was really apt for the conversation today. I I like that. All right, next question. What is the best book that you've read recently? Oh, gosh, you know, I have two small children and I wish I read more books uh, because I do love it. Um, uh, So I don't have a lot on the list uh, recently, but I did finish uh, John Boehner, uh, former speaker's uh, memoir, you know, a few months ago. And I really enjoyed it, uh, sort of a time travel through recent political history. And, you know, if you've ever heard John Boehner speak, which I have many times, uh, you know, I was reading it at the pool and I really felt like John Boehner was over my shoulder reading it to me. I could hear his voice, you know, smell the cigarette and red wine that he was probably uh, holding while he was writing the book. So um, uh, that was a good one. I recommend it to folks. Excellent. I like that. Uh, What is your favorite thing about the work that you do? Well, I think the favorite thing and the thing that gives me the stress is just the the challenges. Um, You know, workforce issues are not particularly easy. I don't think any big issues are, but um, you know, it's it's difficult politically to talk about them, and um, you know, workforce issues can be tricky. Um, so, you know, I, I enjoy the challenge, uh, although it gives me some gray hair. 
Uh, so I would say that, but you know, generally speaking, uh, I really do enjoy working for Relay, the organization. We have great leadership, and and I do have a, a tremendous team I get to work with. So uh, as we get back into the office and I get to actually see them in person, uh, you know, this summer, it's uh, you know, that's that's something I'll enjoy. Excellent. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? I don't know who told me this for the first time, but it's something that I relay uh, to young people. Uh, who I, you know, get sent to, you know, just, you know, do informational interviews or, you know, kids, uh, I say kids, I'm such an old man now, kids coming out of college. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was that uh, when something goes wrong, to look inward first, to see if you could have done something different or better, you know, rather than assuming, you know, is an external thing that made something go wrong or not the right way that you wanted. So just sort of that, you know, look inward, look internally, you know, how you can improve and do better. And uh, I think that's always a, a good message that I send to people and I, I hope to live it, you know, as much as I can. Very nice. All right. Last question. Who or what inspires you? You know, it's a, it, it's probably a common answer, but, uh, you know, really I do everything for my family. Um, so you know, my wife and two kids, but also my, you know, folks uh, and sister back in Texas and, um, you know, my extended family. And, you know, I think that's, that's why most people do what they do. And, you know, mm-hmm. being able to work and doing something you're passionate about is great. And, you know, ultimately you get to go home and have dinner with your folks and, and feel good about everything. So I think, I think that's it. Right, right. Thank you so much for the great conversation this week on Project HR Evan. Of course. Thank you for having me, Jennifer. I want to thank everyone for listening in today, no matter if you're in retail or not. And once again, this is your reminder to grab your copy of the companion guide for this episode at projectionsinc.com slash podcast. Of course, we're always looking for interesting guests, interesting authors, thought leaders, and subject matter experts. If you've got a guest suggestion, email us at projecthr at iriconsultants.com. And last but certainly not least, remember that a new episode of Project HR drops every Thursday. Subscribe to make sure you never miss an episode. I do hope you'll drop me a line, leave us a review, or give Project HR a handful of stars wherever you get your content. That's it for me for now. Let's make it a great day at work.